Okay, yeah. so we are here today to interview Dr. Mitzi Kolar. Uh, she just retired from San Diego State University uh, after 37 years teaching there. And um, she served as coordinator of the piano area yes. and director of graduate studies. Uh, she's also the co-author of several piano method books and my mentor as a piano teacher. Um, so welcome Dr. Kolar. Oh, <laughs> it's good to see you. Yes. Um, so the first question I would like uh, to answer for parents and teachers is just what is pedagogy, piano pedagogy? Pedagogy is just another word for teaching. Um, it is piano teaching and just as we have specialists in the public schools who teach music, they must do a degree in education that prepares them for working with children or working with whatever age group they have specialized in. So what piano pedagogy is about learning how to teach piano, where we look at the psychology, the materials that are going to be taught, strategies for use in, in teaching the lessons and the group areas. So it's everything to do with teaching. Sounds like a lot. <laughs> it is. Um, so when did this field begin, like the piano pedagogy? In the United States, and I'll focus primarily on the United States, we have had method writers, as I am, uh, since the early 1920s. And in the United States, the emphasis or the desire for students to be able to read music has been a key component. Students, as a result, the very earliest method books, John Thompson mm -hmm. and John Chong, all focused on what we call the middle C method, which is where students gradually learn note by note. This is middle C, this is the D above middle C. And we have had these method books in the United States, many, many, many more method books than any other country. And uh, they have largely driven piano teaching. Mm -hmm. In the 1950s, we had two really major leaders in piano teaching that, that uh, came onto the music teaching scene. One was Frances Clark, mm -hmm. and her method would, it, that is still being used in the United States, and Robert Pace. And I had the, the privilege of being one of Robert Pace's graduate teaching assistants. In the 1950s, the, the desire was still to teach reading, but both of these leaders in piano teaching felt that it needed to be a more comprehensive approach, that students okay. needed to understand what they were doing, because until this time it had largely been teaching the notes, the students would focus on learning how to play pieces, and there really wasn't much more involved in their piano lessons. In the so, 1950s it became much more comprehensive. Okay, so. Um, so you started talking about how it kind of started changing, right? It started from, uh, at first it was the middle C method. And then uh, can you go into more details about how the you know, specific changes in piano pedagogy and how it evolved? The, the first degrees in teaching of piano, uh, where you could actually go to a university and learn about it, really also started in, in really the late 50s, 1960s. Okay. Uh, Frances Clark had her new school of music study, which still exists, and then Robert Pace was at Columbia University Teachers College, and he started having uh, largely graduate students come in to learn about teaching piano. We have had in the United States various universities that have done a course or a survey about what materials could be used. But these two, along with Northwestern University in, in Evanston, Illinois, were some of the initial degree granting institutions in pedagogy. Okay. So at that point, uh, they focused on material, but each of the, the two leaders that I mentioned earlier, Pace and Clark, they started, uh, they also focused on their materials, which were more comprehensive to help teachers learn how to teach reading, okay. how to teach creativity, including improvisation, how to become more comprehensive in teaching things like technique. So there were classes in their degree programs where the student could actually teach, mm -hmm. but also observe master teachers working with the various okay. areas. So would you say that the biggest change in you know, thinking 
in terms of piano pedagogy would be um, going from the metal C method to something like more comprehensive where it involves you know everything. It was, but the, the approaches to reading also started changing. Okay. Frances Clark was largely known for intervallic reading, and her method starts with just two lines, and the students start seeing what a second or a step is, mm -hmm. or what thirds are and skips. So it had been totally middle C approach yeah. uh, until Frances came along and started looking at intervallic with the whole idea being that the research that was being done in reading was uh, showing that students needed to also see the distances between notes and also larger patterns of notes, like repetitions of phrases. Pace was much the same way. He didn't look specifically at teaching seconds and thirds exactly the same way. He was known more for multiple key. Okay. And he was one of the first who delved into five-finger positions, or okay. pentachords as we call them. And his is still one of the truly multiple key where a student in their first six weeks of piano lessons plays in all 12 major keys. Because his philosophy was that the student needed to know the entire keyboard. Mm -hmm. Because those original C methods... Yeah. really devoted themselves to teaching only largely the key of C uh -huh. major for many weeks. Yeah. So it was changes of keys, it was changes of approaches to reading, as well as trying to then draw in the comprehensive elements. Okay, so um, you talk about the intervallic reading and then the multi-key approach. So what were some of the problems that came up um, with the original methods of, say, middle C and uh, what was available when it first started? The, uh, and let me say that teachers are still using these materials. In fact, you can find John Thompson all over the world yet being used. And so not to disqualify any, we can have very big successes. But it is, each one may have certain areas that are addressed less. And as a result, there is a weakness. Um, certainly, one of the things that I think was driving both Robert Pace and, and Francis Clark was that although we were trying to teach reading with the, the middle C approach, uh, the students' reading wasn't developing as, as significantly as they thought, and so they felt that the students needed to have a more comprehensive or needed to be looking at other things as well as just the naming of notes. Okay. So rhythm oftentimes will go out the window as a student <laughs> looks and says, oh, that's a D. Uh -huh. The rhythm has gone. And so it was yeah. trying to make sure that the student was also a good rhythmic reader, but they could see larger patterns more rapidly okay. to involve. And in reading... It is notes, it's intervals, it's patterns, it's all of these things that the teacher needs to develop. Okay, so the intervallic method would help the students in terms of sight reading, where they can pick up music faster, where they're not thinking about um, recognizing note letters, as opposed to just seeing the direction and how far the note moves, and translating that to the fingers. That's right. Okay. Um, thanks. I think this would be a good time for you to talk about the celebrate piano method, which you co-authored. Um, so why don't you tell me a little bit about the method and how it came about? Since the, the certainly again all these materials are still available so that we have the Pace method and we have Francis Clark, mm -hmm. but uh, it's called the Music Tree. We um, then Jane Bastian followed short on the steps of, of Robert Pace with a more gradual introduction of keys, but. Since that time, we've had many new methods come out, and each one tries to find the magic combination. <laughs> what can I say? And so my co-authors, Kathy Albergo and Mark Rosinski and I, try to find a unique way in which to combine intervallic mm -hmm. with multiple key okay. and also naming the notes. Uh -huh. And so... Many of the newer, more contemporary methods have certainly tried to find new ways of, again, getting the student and the teacher involved in building all of these areas, whether it's note reading or whether it's intervallic. But the student, ours begins intervallic. So Celebrate Piano, when we first began the method, 
uh, our publisher asked us to, one of the goals was to bridge the gap that mm -hmm. exists between an elementary piano method and the standard classical piano repertoire. Actually, you bring up a good point. So there, there used to be a gap between all the different piano methods, and then when they transferred into the standard repertoire in piano. There can be, yes. Okay, so the standard repertoire would be like... Um, easy Mag Anna Magdalena Bach, mm -hmm. um, your easiest sonatinas, okay. uh, that one when we say standard repertoire, I'm thinking of simple Beethoven sonatinas, the okay. Clementi sonatinas, uh, the easiest of Bergmuller, which mm -hmm. are more romantic type uh, etudes and studies. Okay. So yes, it was that oftentimes when a student finished a method, and, and in the United States we still have many teachers who do not complete an entire method. Those of us that write methods, <laughs> we'd like to see them continue. The whole uh -huh. idea with a set of piano books, whether it's my method or anyone else's, is that we have also tried to gear since the 1950s, both again Francis Clark and Robert Pace were very devoted to musical concepts. And so in Celebrate Piano, we have tried to see that the student is involved in developing their understanding through these musical concepts. And uh, so that they're reading and everything is working together. So we have this gap. So the students uh, sometimes don't complete a method. Uh -huh. before they go into the standard literature, which means that they haven't learned about triplets or they haven't learned about 16th notes. Mm -hmm. That their first introduction to those is sometimes with the standard literature, which yeah. creates a, a little bit of a gap. Or there can be very big differences in the technical elements. So for instance, um, I have usually been a five-finger position teacher but as I had gained experience, I saw that the, my students who stayed pretty much glued to a five-finger position mm -hmm. had trouble moving out to Bach and Magdalena mm -hmm. because their hand wasn't prepared for all the movement. And so it's those kinds of concepts, whether it's physical movement, it's a rhythmic concept, or whether they haven't played scales and they're jumping into repertoire with scales, that again, it's what the method tries to do is prepare the student musically mm -hmm. with all the concepts and all the rhythms that, that they need to play in their classical repertoire, physically or technically, so that they can easily play thumb under scales or a more arpeggio okay. figure. Yeah. And, and again, so all these things are working together. So, I mean, I've heard, what would you say to teachers that, because I've definitely heard teachers that say that as a piano teacher, your goal is to get your students away from piano methods as quickly as you can. And many do uh -huh. try to move their students quickly away. So what would be the problem that, that might occur when that happens? Is that you can talk about the gap. So when it gets to the newer music, what happens because of that gap? It's, it, the students have, a, it's a slower learning process. Mm -hmm. And really, it should be a seamless transition. So when I have transfer students who mm -hmm. maybe only did two levels of whatever method, mm -hmm. it means that in two levels of a piano method, usually it's largely eighth notes that oh, they have okay. covered. They haven't covered any of the rhythms. So I have to then make a much larger preparation or presentation of activities with triplets, with sixteenths, when I start introducing those elements. Mm -hmm. If they've only had two years of piano instruction in many of our modern methods, mm -hmm. um, they won't have played a, a, an eight note major scale. Okay. And they won't have played a lot of thumb under, which means that then all of a sudden the movement of the hand is very difficult. What that does is slows down the learning process. The transition from eighth notes and five finger position to Bach that moves all over the keyboard yeah. and has a variety of different rhythms is not only technically challenging, mm -hmm. it it's also can be musically and cognitively very challenging. 
So with that gap there, what happens when students get to the standard repertoire is that it, it's a lot of frustration in terms of new, a bunch of new things they have to all of a sudden learn to complete a piece. That's right. It can be very frustrating because uh, it slows down the process. It means that to learn that piece is, is harder. They stay on that piece longer. And mm -hmm. for a younger student to stay on a piece uh, for any length of time and to really can work it for a long time can become very boring yeah. and will cut their motivation and practice and all sorts okay. of things. Yeah. So it sounds like you're, when you first started this, that you were. It sounds like you guys took all the best parts of the different methods uh, from the beginning, and you added into the sort of the piano method. Um, so can you go into more details into how sort of the piano method bridges that gap? Because you mentioned that too. How exactly does it uh, bridge the gap between the method and the standard repertoire? We were, first of all, very careful about making sure that we had all of the concepts very carefully sequenced. Okay. And so from the very beginning to the end, the student uh, gradually works from seconds to thirds to fourths to fifths, sixths, sevenths, octaves, so that then they are looking at the, the span and the movement of the hand over a greater distance. That being one thing. Um, we carefully design technical exercises that are just not five finger position patterns, but where the student has to learn how to leap the hand, or where the two hands need to work independently, which is one of the things that in a lot of our methods where the hand, left hand particularly, plays a lot of block chords or just outlining of chords, that's another issue that if we're moving into more contrapuntal music that we have in Bach, the left hand hasn't had experience at anything yeah. but playing block chords or slightly arpeggiated chords. They're not used to that movement. So our technical exercises try to uh, accommodate a different use of the hand and preparation for things like leaps of octaves or patterns that you might find at the cadence of Mozart or, or Bach. The other thing we, we tried to do was to integrate okay. standard classical repertoire into the actual core method book. Okay. Now, many do. Um, we tried to do it very consistently, so for instance, our very first classical pieces occur already in the second level, which is earlier than a majority of the methods, so we do a lot of simple Turk uh -huh. uh, pieces, Turk, Kabalevsky, that are all presented in the original format and in the original editing. Okay. Do some methods not, is it not in the original version? It can be an arrangement, right. Of, of the original. It usually will tell you that, Okay. but uh, certainly you as the teacher need to, to look, but uh, oftentimes familiar themes are used, mm -hmm. or um, there because the piece might present a rhythm okay. or a technical little skill in the original that, that the, the authors of the method may feel is too difficult, they may take liberties with some of the original. So they might simplify that yes. particular rhythm. Yes. Okay. You mentioned um, that your method was is really, you said you paid a lot of attention to the sequencing of the concepts. Um, can you go into more details about sequencing concepts and what benefits that has or what might be problems if concepts aren't sequenced correctly? Well, so for instance, again, using the, the rhythm as, in, as an example, um, another area just to, to reinforce uh, the whole idea of concept, that not only were we careful about the sequencing, but we really were very careful about the amount of reinforcement. Okay. A lot of times, it's not an easy task to be a method writer, and it's very easy to introduce a major chord or a dominant seventh, the five seven, mm -hmm. present it in a piece and then leave it out for 10 pages. Yeah. Or <laughs> let's talk about time signature. We can introduce two four and then never see it again for 15 pages. 
So uh, the Celebrate Piano co-authors attempted very carefully to trace that not only once it was presented, that it was consistently used in the repertoire in the book, but in also all the accompanying activities with that uh, are in Celebrate Piano. When we say sequencing, it, in other words, once a second is introduced, that you wouldn't necessarily just randomly jump to an octave because okay. a student's hand has to be ready to make that leap. Mm -hmm. So it's finding ways in which you can sequence seconds, then thirds, and then the combinations of seconds and thirds, because reading the difference between what is a third and what is a second and then seeing them in combination is also very important to the sequence. It's very, when something tends to be left out or not reinforced in conceptual teaching, once again, the student is going to start stumbling and, and is going to become more frustrated because they don't automatically pick up the, the, the process that's going on. I see. Um, you said uh, sort of kind of as a comprehensive method. Could you talk a little bit more about all the different aspects that makes it comprehensive? We wanted to, first of all, have the students playing, okay. which every method does. <laughs> so that means you, you do try to, to incorporate all of, all of the uh, repertoire that you can. And we, we had the advantage of our publisher decided to um, ask many composers, both here in North, well, in all of North America, mm -hmm. Canada, and the United States, to write pieces for us specifically. So it's, it's a variety of repertoire. But in addition to having the students play, we felt it was important for listening. So one of the unique okay. elements about Celebrate Piano is that in, we're divided into units, and so every unit has ear skills or ear activities to develop the students. Can they hear the second? Can they hear the difference between a second and a third? Uh, can they clap back simple rhythms that are given to them? So there's ear training in, in all of the units. There certainly are technical components in every unit. So reading, technique, ear skills. Mm -hmm. We have rhythmic activities in every unit because rhythm is one of the first things that goes. So a student needs that constant time <laughs> of what time signature, how, how do we count this, what do we do for the rhythm. And then uh, another very consistent area in Celebrate Piano is the creativity. Okay. Um, all three of the co-authors of Celebrate Piano are very devoted to um, improvisation, composition. So every unit has question and answers or creating a composition that might use whole steps or half steps mm -hmm. or um, again, those seconds and thirds, and, or even telling very simple creative stories in the beginning. So every unit through all four levels has creative activities as well. So we want musicianship, a uh, whole other area, uh, the, the area of theory. So in yeah. every unit there are several activities in music theory as well. Okay. I know, because I use Cyber Piano to teach my kids, and I think one of the things I tell parents that, um, that I like about it, obviously everything you said, I also said, but one of the things I can tell them is, hey, if you this method, you're going to buy two books. You know, you got the Lessons in Music Instruction book, and you have the Solos book, and the CD accompaniment. Um, I think that's really cool that all everything you talk about is just in one Lesson in Music Instruction book, as opposed to maybe three, four, five different books. And what I find with that is, a lot of times when you have four or five different books, parents start picking and choosing which ones they want their kids to buy or to learn from. And then the first thing that they leave out is theory, or they leave out technique. They just want the, they just want the pieces, they just want the lessons, and that's it. So I think that's one really cool thing about the, the method. Um, so obviously there's um, lots of strengths. Um, is it possible? Could you think of any weaknesses, um, if you have to pick one, about Cerebral Piano Method? 
Well, as, you, as a co-author, you see different things that you would like to move around. Mm -hmm. um, there, uh, wow, you, you, you at all times want more literature. So okay. we do have the Solos book that we try to incorporate every, again, that's related to the concepts and the ideas, the technical skills that are being presented in the lesson and musicianship book. Um, and certainly one of the big questions that gets asked, and I've been reflecting on it, is we felt that to get the students seeing the intervals, mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of the, the current methods don't look so specifically at seconds and thirds and, and develop the intervallic reading, and it, it is a key component. Now you have to understand, that's not where I originally started as a piano teacher. Um, I started in a five finger where we looked at skip and step and we weren't identifying well this is a line going through a space the, the mm -hmm. second as carefully. And so my thinking has evolved in that regard and I see the importance of the inner valley. A lot of teachers will ask well should they be reading their note names sooner? And um, so maybe one of the things that my co-authors and I would love to to do is to do more teaching videos so that they can okay. that a teacher can see that they can start incorporating elements about note naming um, possibly earlier, but that that oftentimes they when they do get to that part in one B, mm -hmm. they forget to name the notes. And, you know, okay. they, they just continue to focus on the intervals, which is still key. But uh, there are lots of activities that a teacher needs to reinforce note naming at that point in time. So it, maybe I would uh, see if there weren't activities and videos that we could create that would let the teacher see that certain note naming can start earlier. Okay. And uh, that isn't mentioned. One of the things that I think my co-authors and I quickly learned uh -huh. is that you, you can't put everything into a method book. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that all my good friends and colleagues out there who have written methods would agree. Yeah. You just can't say everything. You have to leave some things up to the teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, because the t when we first started, there were too many words on our pages. And, okay. and if it's the child, children's book, you can't yeah. have that many words. And so uh, it's always give and take. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so I think we can stop there for today. Okay. Um, for the pedagogy, I'm uh, talking about the piano method and the piano pedagogy field in general. Okay. Great. Um, thank, thank you. you.